Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on our relationship with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. As everyone's logging into the webinar, we do have some poll questions open. So please uh, take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourselves with our poll questions. And while people are logging in, I'll turn it over to Bruce Johnson. Actually, Charlie goes first. Okay, well, I'm happy to welcome everybody as you log into this webinar about the new standard operating procedures for the MOU between the Sea Scouts and the Coast Guard Auxiliary. I hope you'll find uh, this evening's session informative, and I also hope you'll share this knowledge with others in, in support of both programs. Also, just to let you know, we're recording this session for future use and please do make use of the feedback systems both during and after the session. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'm Bruce Johnson and I'm the uh, chair of the relationship subcommittee of the National Sea Scout Committee. Uh, we're going to talk this evening about the Auxiliary Sea Scout Youth Development Program or Aux Scout Standard Operating Procedure and we're going to be uh, viewing it from the Sea Scouting perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, my presentation is going to be in three broad areas. We're going to take a few moments to explain what the AUX Scout program is. I'm going to go into some detail about the new standard operating procedure. And then there are some points that I want to go over with you as you work with the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary. Next slide, pr please. Um, just a word about the Coast Guard Auxiliary. It was established by Act of Congress in 1939 to assist the Coast Guard. It currently has about 25,000 members and membership is currently open to U.S. citizens who are at least 17 years old. The Auxiliary's mission is to promote and improve recreational boating safety, to promote trained crews and facilities to augment the Coast Guard, and enhance safety and security of our ports, waterways, and coastal regions, and to support the Coast Guard's operational, administrative, and logistical requirements. It's important to remember that while the Coast Guard Auxiliary is a volunteer organization, it is a part of the U.S. Coast Guard, and so as such, uh, it lives by Coast Guard rules. Next slide. The Boy Scouts of America um, uh, agreed to a memorandum of agreement with the Coast Guard Auxiliary in 2009. And up until recently, that was what we were working with. The original MOA uh, focused on four areas, uh, in particular public education programs, uh, outreach for recreational boating safety, uh, supporting facilities, and uh, uh, sharing volunteer uh, support in both organizations. We've had a very productive 10 years of working with the Coast Guard Auxiliary, but it hasn't accomplished as much as we would like, or frankly, as much as the Auxiliary would like. Next slide, please. This past summer, we agreed to a new MOA and it calls for a number of changes in the relationship between Sea Scouting and the Coast Guard Auxiliary. In particular, uh, this is meant to um, take the, the relationship between the two groups to the next level. And there are a number of program enhancements that the Sea Scout program will see because of this relationship. Next slide, please. So we're gonna spend most of uh, the remaining time talking about the standard operating procedure and talking about what it is and what it says and what it means for us as Sea Scout leaders. Next slide. 
the memorandum of agreement was uh, 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 an agreement that explained or that made commitments on the part of both the Boy Scouts of America and the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary to provide certain resources for one another and uh, define certain objectives that were very specific. Uh, what was what has been lacking up until recently was a document called a Standard Operating Procedure or SOP, and it establishes the procedures for making this happen. Um, what you see on the right side of the screen is um, uh, the first page from the SOP. Uh, it was decided at Coast Guard headquarters that a pilot program would be run in the Coast Guard Auxiliary's 5th Southern and 9th Eastern districts. So 5th Southern basically is Maryland, DC, Virginia, and North Carolina. And 9th Eastern is basically Western New York, Northwest Pennsylvania, and Northeast Ohio. With the uh, release of the SOP, the uh, pilot program has begun and it is scheduled to run through the end of August. Uh, in talking with Coast Guard headquarters, their intention is to see this get rolled out nationally very shortly thereafter. And I believe what they mean by that is in September of this year. It's possible that other districts could be added to this SOP between now and then, but we're focusing on these two districts because these districts are now actively involved in this and understand what their roles are to, to make this happen. One of the objectives of uh, this test is to identify issues that need to be clarified or adjusted. And just in the, the two weeks since the SOP was released, I've received dozens of questions from uh, auxiliary leaders and Sea Scout leaders about how to handle certain things. And as the need arises, either the SOP is being updated or supplementary cheat sheets are being developed and issued to the field to uh, address those issues. Next slide, please. So what's included in the SOP? Well, um, most important to us in, in the Sea Scout program is that it's uh, committing the auxiliary to providing uh, improved and enhanced training opportunities. Um, obviously, one of the things that the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard Auxiliary is interested in is uh, being able to interact with Sea Scouts, Sea Scout leaders, and Sea Scout parents uh, with an eye towards exploring uh, career opportunities or potential service opportunities uh, for, for uh, the two groups to work together. Um, we both are committed to promoting recreational boating safety to the general public. Uh, having been a skipper for many years, um, my <coughs> ship saw plenty of uh, instances of unsafe boating practices, and uh, I'm very pleased that the two groups will be working together to promote boating safety to the general public. One thing to remember is that while this is a commitment to work together and uh, to further both groups' goals, it, it does not legally bind either uh, the Auxiliary or the Boy Scouts of America to do anything if there is a reason not to. Next slide, please. So who's included? Uh, the first thing that uh, I want to mention, and this is a huge change for the Coast Guard Auxiliary, is that uh, all uh, currently registered Sea Scouts who are at least 14 years old uh, will be allowed to apply for auxiliary membership if they wish. They're not required to do it, and um, but uh, to... to uh, Re, uh, reap the benefits of this agreement, but we know anecdotally that some Sea Scouts are in fact interested in doing that. Uh, for a Sea Scout who is under the age of 17 
to retain their auxiliary membership, they must maintain their Sea Scout registration at least until their 17th birthday. So it's important to say that the auxiliary is not lowering their minimum age for membership uh, in the auxiliary for the general public. This benefit is only being offered to Sea Scouts. Um, all Sea Scouts and Sea Scout leaders participating in auxiliary programs will be expected to abide by the SOP. And that's one reason why we're here this evening is to make you aware of what the SOP says. Any Sea Scouts or leaders may attend auxiliary flotilla or division meetings or activities as their guests. And that's important to say that publicly because the auxiliary's literature up to this point has been a little ambiguous. So the SOP amplifies on the standard, uh, on the MOA in making it clear that uh, Sea Scouts and their leaders are welcome to attend meetings and, and auxiliary uh, activities. All Sea Scouts or leaders who are actively participating in auxiliary programs or training are encouraged to consider applying for, the auxil for auxiliary membership. And the key word there is encouraged. They're, they uh, under, are under no obligation to join the auxiliary. Next slide. This is another important point uh, to remind auxiliarists that they are uh, allowed to serve as BSA volunteer uh, leaders. And then this next point is a huge change for the auxiliary. Uh, auxiliary flotillas and divisions, and flotillas are analogous to our Sea Scout ships. They are the local units. And then the next organizational level up from that is the division. Uh, flotillas and divisions are encouraged, authorized and encouraged to charter local Sea Scout ships. Up to this point, that hasn't been possible with the new SOP. Uh, that is not only possible, but it's they are being encouraged to do that. Next slide, please. Program oversight. Um, the, this uh, initiative is being uh, um, overseen by the Youth Programs Division of the Auxiliary's Human Resources Directorate. On the Sea Scout side, oversight rests with the National Sea Scout Committee's Relationships Subcommittee. As it happens, I chair both of those groups, and this has been very good for the program because it gives me direct access to senior leadership in both organizations. So as uh, uh, questions arise, I have direct access to the people with answers. Next slide. Auxiliarist contact with BSA youth. Um, the point, um, I'll, I'll go through this and then I'll explain why it's significant. Auxiliarists who uh, may regularly interact with youth members of BSA must have read the MOA between our two organizations, must have read and th be th thoroughly familiar with the SOP and must successfully complete youth protection training and provide completion document, uh, documentation to their flotilla commander. And they're required to renew this every two years. And uh, much of my time today was spent getting the mechanisms in place for the auxiliary to be able to track that. Next slide. Regular interaction means any direct interaction, face-to-face, -face, via phone, email, or text, with BSA youth more than once each calendar year. This does not, however, include public education or public affairs activities that are provided to the general public, nor does it include regular auxiliary unit meetings. So if Sea Scouts visit a flotilla meeting, that doesn't uh, mean that the uh, auxiliary leadership there has to take youth protection training. Next slide. Uh, you're probably getting the sense that the Coast Guard is taking youth protection seriously. They looked at what BSA does for youth protection 
and they basically said they they were in total agreement with BSA on youth protection rules and they're mandating that the Coast Guard Auxiliaries live by those same rules as they work with our Sea Scout youth. Um, if there is a cardinal rule, uh, no auxiliars will ever put themselves in a one-on-one -on -one situation with BSA youth. And then the rest of the slide just talks about too deep leadership, which exactly mirrors what we all uh, work with as Sea uh, Scout adult leaders. Next slide. Chartering Sea Scout ships. Uh, flotillas and divisions may charter ships they will have to request authorization through their lead, uh, chain of leadership to the local director of auxiliary. Um, and the procedure for do that, doing that is pretty simple. Basically, uh, if a flotilla or division decides that they want to charter a ship, in addition to uh, what we all are very familiar with, uh, in organizing a new ship, they will also have to request permission through their chain of leadership and get that permission from the director of auxiliary. Uh, and if you hear somebody refer to DIROX, that's what uh, the director of auxiliary is colloquially uh, referred to. They will also have to demonstrate that they have taken youth protection training. And there are a number of positions in the flotilla and division where the incumbents will have to take YPT training, regardless of whether they're directly in, involved with the Sea Scouts or not. Uh, there are detailed instructions for all of this on the Oxby Wiki site uh, on a page called Standard Operating Procedures. Next slide. I'm not going to go into uh, the slide in any detail. The bottom line is that the Coast Guard is requiring that any Sea Scout youth under the age of 17, uh, whether they are registered as an auxiliarist or not, they will have to have a consent form. Um, they are being provided with a link to BSA's uh, form page, but they're not. Re uh, the Coast Guard is not requiring. Uh, that that consent form be used. Um, the uh, auxiliary mission leader will be required to confirm that a consent form has been signed and brought to the activity, but the auxiliary will not be collecting those forms and will not be collecting any personally identifiable information uh, uh, on any Sea Scouts or Sea Scout leaders for any reason other than tracking training completion. Next slide. Here's an important statement for us. Uh, sea Scouts are authorized to use Coast Guard training and recreation facilities. I think the wording of this statement is a little bit ambiguous because it's unclear whether this uh, relate, uh, refers to all Sea Scouts or just Sea Scouts who are directly involved with uh, the auxiliary. I suspect it's the latter. They may participate in Coast Guard cruises and air operations at the discretion of commanding officers and with district commander approval. Where that's most likely to come into uh, play is Sea Scouts going out on training patrols with local um, Coast Guard Auxiliary operational facilities. Next slide. Authorized activities. Uh, sea Scouts and leaders may participate in auxiliary uh, programs to the extent authorized in the SOP. Uh, if that sounds a little vague, it was meant to be, it was meant to encourage uh, as broad a joint participation as possible. Um, sea Scouts and leaders who are not enrolled in the auxiliary are welcome to attend unit meetings as guests. Sea Scouts under the age of 18 must be accompanied by a parent, guardian, or person in loco parentis consistent with BSA youth protection training. So let's say that a 15-year-old Sea Scout would like to visit a flotilla meeting. Uh, they need to be accompanied by one of uh, the individuals I just mentioned, a parent, guardian, or person in loco parentis. Next slide. 
um, something that we've been doing for quite some time. The auxiliary, uh, auxiliary uh, is authorized and encouraged to perform vessel safety checks uh, on vessels that are owned or operated by the Sea Scouts and other BSA members. Of course, this has uh, been going on for many years, and uh, this is the time of year that I should be reminding everybody that uh, all Sea Scout vessels should be getting their annual vessel safety checks sometime soon, uh, ideally before your boating season starts. The auxiliary will provide Sea Scouts and other BSA members with recreational boating safety literature for distribution to Sea Scouts or the general public. So, for example, if your Sea Scout ship would like to have some boating safety literature uh, to incorporate into a mall show or a scout show, uh, you can request that from a local Coast Guard Auxiliary flotilla and they will provide it to you. Uh, at no cost. Next slide. Joint operations. Uh, auxiliary facilities and Sea Scout facilities, and by facilities they mean vessels, are encouraged to promote professional development with appropriate authorization from Coast Guard order issuing authorities. So let's say that your ship is uh, doing a kayak uh, patrol uh, or a kayak uh, cruise in your inner harbor, and you want to do that jointly with uh, an auxiliary ox pad patrol, uh, this is encouraged, and uh, the auxiliary will have to get the uh, appropriate clearances from the Coast Guard, but there should be no problem with that. The auxiliary will provide shoreside and underway training for, co for Sea Scouts and other BSA members at auxiliary installations and on operational facilities. Again, uh, operational facility is meant to be a Coast Guard auxiliary vessel belonging to or used by the auxiliary or the Coast Guard in a manner consistent with Coast Guard auxiliary and BSA po policies. Auxiliary mission leaders will ensure that Sea Scouts and leaders are fully outfitted with all personal protective equipment as required for the mission. So if Sea Scouts or leaders are taken out on a training patrol, they will be issued with the appropriate uh, safety gear for that mission. Next slide. Auxiliary facilities with Sea Scout Sea Scouts aboard won't be scheduled for search and rescue standby duty or search and rescue response missions, but if the facility has uh, Sea Scouts aboard and is called out for a SAR incident, the Sea Scouts may remain aboard but will not be involved with the operation. And frankly, I think they would find it really interesting to see how that's handled. Um, the auxiliary is trained and trained and trained for how this uh, is how this is done, and uh, there would be a lot to be learned by watching it happen. For any mission involving an auxiliary facility carrying Sea Scouts or leaders who are not auxiliaries, the order issuing authority must be made aware that the facility will be carrying them as guests, provide names of Sea Scouts and leaders aboard. Uh, it's important to know that uh, for every patrol that the auxiliary does, they have to request operational orders from the Coast Guard. And what they will have to do when they do that is to include the names of Sea Scouts and leaders who will be aboard. And it is within the right of the order issuing authority to review that. And if they feel that what the patrol is going to be doing is inconsistent with having uh, Sea Scout youth aboard, they can deny permission for that. So we just need to be aware of that. It's not that they're uh, being mean or going back on a commitment that the Coast Guard has made. Um, it, it, there's a strong sense of responsibility that is drilled into all Coast Guard and Coast Guard auxiliary leaders. Uh, and um, so they have to assess the risk involved, and if the risk is seen as being uh, unacceptable, then they say no. Next slide.
STEM. Uh, I know that we all have heard a lot about how STEM is important to uh, the Boy Scouts of America, and we're seeing more and more of that incorporated into the Sea Scout program. This is equally true of the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary, and one of the program areas that the National Commodore wants to see us working on is to uh, provide STEM activities and training for the uh, Sea Scout program. Examples of this include the auxiliary introduction mission where uh, teenagers uh, get to go to the Coast Guard Academy for a week or two of training and indoctrination. And I think some Sea Scouts would probably welcome the opportunity to work on that. Another uh, uh, program is the Auxiliary University program. There are a number of universities around the country that have Coast Guard Auxiliary uh, uh, detachments, and they are very close in age to our Sea Scouts, and the training that uh, is offered to them would be particularly appropriate to Sea Scouts. So uh, this is something that the Auxiliary will be working on in the near future, but it's not currently a focus of what the Auxiliary is doing. Next slide. Uniforms. Uh, sea Scouts and leaders who aren't auxiliarists must wear appropriate Sea Scout uniforms while participating in auxiliary activities. Uh, I hope that is uh, straightforward. Um, uh, showing up on uh, an auxiliary facility in cutoff jeans and a ratty old t-shirt is not going to cut it. Uh, the expectation will be that they'll be in appropriate Sea Scout uniform. Sea Scout leaders, uh, Sea Scouts and leaders who are auxiliaries will wear the auxiliary uniform when assigned to duty and engaged in auxiliary activities. Uh, sea Scout ribbons and other insignia are not authorized for wear on the auxiliary uniform. And auxiliaries who are Sea Scouts or Sea Scout leaders will wear the appropriate Sea Scout uniform when engaging in Sea Scout activities when not assigned to auxiliary duty. I hope this uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, what, when you would wear what uniform? Next slide. Okay, so there are some points to remember. Uh, just as uh, every ship is unique in some way, auxiliary units differ based on member interest and demographics. Um, and a good partnership between the Sea Scouts and the auxiliary will provide a benefit to both organizations. So don't see this as a one-way street. Uh, the, the auxiliary is offering support to us and they're looking for some support from us. Next slide. Reaching out to the auxiliary. Again, I want to remind you that the SOP is currently being applied to only the auxiliaries 5th Southern and 9th Eastern districts. Most other districts, uh, I know anecdotally, assume that they're in a waiting mode until September. They think that they can't do anything until they're included in the SOP. And while that's not true, it's a safe thing to assume. Uh, for those other districts though, uh, we in the Sea Scout program can be reaching out to uh, the local districts to introduce ourselves and make uh, ourselves known to the auxiliary and make them feel welcome. Some of the districts that are not currently a part of the SOP already have district Sea Scout coordinators and uh, I will be happy to provide their names and contact information to anybody who uh, is interested. Um, and uh, otherwise, I can provide you some guidance on how to identify local units. Next slide. Okay, so if you are in the pilot roll, rollout areas, and we've talked about where, where those are, um, this slide shows Fifth Southern, basically. Um, you should be reaching out to the, your auxiliary counterparts and explore how you can work with them. I'm the contact for Fifth Southern, 
and Jean Little uh, in Western New York is the contact for Ninth Eastern. Coordinate with those people so that you know what the best way is to approach uh, the local auxiliary. We have local knowledge and we'll help you uh, uh, make contact with the right people so that your time and effort is more productive. Next slide. This is the uh, area covered by Ninth Eastern. Um, I, I want to remind everybody that a scout is friendly. Um, I've been involved with the Sea Scout program for 40 plus years, and I've had the good fortune of working with hundreds of wonderful Sea Scouts and Sea Scout leaders over the years. I have uh, worked with a few who were difficult to work with, and we want to be careful when we're uh, interacting with the Coast Guard Auxiliary that we're setting our best foot forward. All of this is brand new for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. They've never made this sort of commitment in the past. And what we're asking them to do is definitely outside the comfort zone of some auxiliaries. I don't believe that all auxiliaries are going to think that this is a wonderful thing working with teenagers, but I have heard from many, many auxiliaries who do think it is and are really looking forward to working with our Sea Scout youth. You want to reach out in a friendly way and don't make demands. Look for ways to work together with the auxiliary. Offer to help uh, staff boating safety booths at the local boat show with the auxiliary. You might want to consider doing a joint shoreline cleanup project uh, since uh, marine environmental protection is one of the Coast Guard's missions. Next slide, please. On the uh, SOP page, there are a series of links um, to important resources. Uh, if you uh, do nothing uh, but what I'm about to tell you, you would really help yourself out. These links are the key links that will help you to uh, connect with the right people and get the information that you need to make this uh, relationship productive. Next slide. So I think what we'll do is let's hold questions for a moment because TW is going to amplify a, a few of these points, uh, talking about his experience working uh, together with the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Sea Scouts in his area. TW. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So Bruce mentioned that we've had a relationship with the Coast Guard Auxiliary for a really long time. And even if we didn't, the kind of things that we need are the kind of things that they're in the business of providing. So I want to talk about some things that if you're not in one of these pilot areas, you can still dive right into this and start building the relationship, start accessing the expertise uh, and, uh, and get this going. You know, the very first essential thing is voter safety uh, training. Our Sea Scouts are required to have voter safety training for advancement. In pretty much every state these days, a, a youth of Sea Scout age is required to have a voter safety card, voter education card to be able to operate a vessel. And this is one of the things that the auxiliary does really well. So uh, start looking to them as, as a source for that. In conjunction with that, um, Bruce mentioned vessel safety checks. Uh, the auxiliary um, would love to come out and do vessel safety checks for all of your boats. So ask them to do that, uh, get involved with them and start meeting some people. So those are, those are easy things that you need anyway. Next slide, please. You can move beyond that and look at uh, and look at more training. Uh, the auxiliary has two forms of training, what they call public education or PE, which is their training to the general voting public, and member training, uh, which is their internal training. A lot of that public education training is stuff that is uh, dead center on what Sea Scouts need. The Boating Skills and Seamanship course is one of the flagship courses that they offer. Uh, it is really tightly coupled to Sea Scout Advancement. Uh, there is a companion course called Sailing Skills and Seamanship, which is even closer to what we usually do. 
Uh, it's taught a little less frequently because a lot of auxiliary flotillas don't have sailors. But if you can find someone that does, that's great. There's a variety of navigation courses as well. These are all things that we have taught, have used successfully with our Sea Scouts for years. So this is not, you know, wild, uh, crazy stuff. These are things that, uh, that work, are known to work, and that you could do right now. Next slide, please. Um, on the water, opportunities exist as well. So you might want to, uh, let's suppose that you need a safety boat for a sailing regatta that you're, you're conducting for your Sea Scouts. You might talk to your local auxiliary folks and see if they'll come and help you out. We've had really good success in getting support for Sea Scout events in our area just by, uh, by asking for it. Uh, this is, uh, as Bruce mentioned, they train for this sort of thing extensively. Uh, they have capability of, of, they know how to organize a safety zone around an event. They know how to support a disabled vessel. Um, all of those skills uh, you can harness right now if you ask. Um, one more slide, please. The other underrated opportunity is, is what they would call a PA or public affairs uh, booth. Basically, the, the displays that they have at boat shows. Turns out that no matter how many cool toys you put in one of those booths, if it's staffed by a bunch of old geezers like me, it's really hard to get youth interested in talking to you. On the other hand, if there are some competent looking youth standing there with actually looking like they're part of the deal rather than having been drugged there by their parents, all of the kids that come through are gonna to wanna to come and find out what's up. You will have families with kids coming through your booth all the time. This is a great opportunity for our Sea Scouts to show off what they know. It's a huge win for the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Uh, it's a win for our Sea Scouts and it's stuff that we can do today. Uh, all of these are easy things if you just go and establish the relationship and they've been used, we've all been using them, some of us been using them for years. You can do some combinations. One of our local flotilla, our local ships rather, uh, decided they wanted to conduct a water safety weekend for a couple of Boy Scout troops um, in the area. So they contacted the local flotilla. They uh, set it up so that the first activity was boater safety training. Uh, they just did the state boater safety training. So all of the kids in the troop got their boater, their boater safety card. Then they did an on the water experience. They got an auxiliary safety patrol to support their sailboats that are out in the water. Turned out to be convenient because one of them broke down and needed to be towed in. Uh, they had the Sea Scouts teaching um, points of sail and basic sailing stuff ashore while others were getting experiences on the water. It was a great experience for everyone. The Boy Scouts had a grand time and several of them and sub subsequently decided to join Sea Scouts. Uh, the auxiliary felt it was, they were performing their mission, uh, but rec recreational boater safety. Uh, so there, there are simple win-win things like that that we can do anywhere in the country. Um, Bruce, that's the end of it. We had a few questions. Uh, shall we go over those now? Yeah, let's please do that. So one of them was, um, first of all, I guess I should point out that all those links that Bruce, uh, Bruce showed you earlier, if you go to cscott.org slash cgox, you can find all of them there. So that's really the only one you need to remember. Someone asked if uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary can now take sea badge. That has been authorized. We don't wanna broadcast it terribly widely because we don't have the capacity for all of them, but strategic people that are interested in learning more about working with our youth Sea Scouts are welcome to come to Sea Badge. Uh, the next one of those, we've got one coming up in May in Tennessee. I think that there's an April one in Colorado. Um, the upcoming courses are on seascout.org. Someone else asked, how far in advance do they have to have the names for orders in order to be able to, um, in order to be able to come on board? And that depends on the local order issuing authority. Where I am, there's a hard cutoff of Thursday morning for orders for the following weekend, and they really want to see them a week in advance. And, uh, and yeah, in my area, you have to uh, put in your order request at least seven days before the intended uh, patrol. So, so significant that, advance notice is going to be is going to be required for that. Mm -hmm. um, Someone asked if, if you have a Sea Scout or an or a adult leader who is working on boat crew qualifications, 
would they still need to be added to orders? Uh, I'll tell you how I read this and Bruce can uh, disagree. The process of working on boat crew certification in the Coast Guard Auxiliary involves completing a bunch of shoreside training and being signed off on it, then being uh, registered as a trainee and issued PPE, personal protective equipment, such as a, uh, a, a, a personal locator beacon and, and life jacket and stuff. At that point, you are an auxiliary member and a trainee, and you don't actually have to be explicitly called out on the orders in advance, at least where I am. Until you get to that point, you're a guest and you operate under the under the rules that are that are allowed here. Is that your understanding, Bruce? Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, once once they are a member and they're going through that training process, that way, um, the uh, their information is uh, entered into the uh, order request as a trainee. But uh, if they're not an auxiliary member then it would go in the notes field uh, explaining uh, that Sea Scout or Sea Scout leaders A, B, and C are uh, planning on uh, going out with the patrol as, as trainees, and that's how, they, how that will be uh, handled. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, we have uh, one question. Will you post this video somewhere after the presentation? We'll put a link to it on that page, seascout.org slash cgox. Uh, you'll also get a link in the um, Sea Scouts BSA Facebook group, so it should be easy to find. Um, someone asked, will cost for AUX training materials be waived for Sea Scouts? Bruce, that one's for you. Um, well, there are two answers to this. Uh, sea Scouts who register as auxiliaries um, don't have to pay for any training materials. Uh, as for Sea Scouts who aren't registered as auxiliaries, it will really be up to the local flotilla to decide how they want to handle that. There's considerable discussion, for example, in my district about uh, waiving uh, uh, dues for Sea Scouts who register with the auxiliary. Uh, but there's no national policy on that. You can assume, though, that if a Sea Scout or Sea Scout leader registers as an auxiliarist, there will be no cost for the training materials. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question here. Uh, our local flotilla has had issues getting off orders to patrol on many lakes in the area. Will they have an opportunity to get further orders to patrol lakes to assist Sea Scouts or other Sea Scout locations like a BSA camp? I think ultimately that's going to be up to the local order issuing authority, which is normally associated with the Coast Guard sector that uh, that you're in. Uh, Bruce, do you have any guidance beyond that? Well, you should be aware that uh, the Coast Guard uh, doesn't have unlimited funding. Um, it's the the uh, smallest of the military services. And um, so they have a certain amount of money budgeted every year for getting underway. And they will make some of that funding available to Coast Guard Auxiliary uh, to uh, cover the costs associated with patrols. And, and they will prioritize uh, the things that you would expect would be priority. Things like search and, uh, search and rescue missions, and law enforcement activities, uh, marine environmental protection activities, uh, and uh, handling regatta patrols and that sort of thing. Um, so training patrols tend to be a little bit lower on the list of priorities. It really depends on what funding is available. Uh, it's much better today than it was 15 years ago, but it's not an unlimited pool. So. I can't promise you that the funding situation locally will necessarily change because of this. You should, we should also point out that they're on a government fiscal year, which means that toward the end of that fiscal year, mm -hmm. um, there, the funding can start to run out. In our part of the world, uh, they start curtailing um, orders uh, and not issuing further orders after a certain point if the funding is, is nearly gone. So that can be a, uh, there can be a seasonality to it. The fiscal year, for those who may not be attuned to it, is October 1st to September 30th. I can tell you that after the end of August in Sector Maryland National Capital Region, um, 
almost all of the patrols in September are for marine events and other very specific activities, uh, which doesn't mean that Sea Scouts wouldn't be able to get out, but they, they are much more selective about uh, uh, under what circumstance uh, they'll give, give orders. All right, we have one more question here. Let's see, are there specifics regarding Scout fundraising and finances with respect to Scout non-CG OX activities? Can non-OX Scouters outside of the charter organization raise and spend funds for the unit? I'm not completely clear about what the ask there is. My, my take on that is that the uh, fundraising rules uh, for a uh, auxiliary chartered Sea Scout ship would be the same as the, it would be for another unit, but I may be misunderstanding the question. Right, I think that's the, that's the case and, and that's the best I, I've got as well. Uh, we have another one, an attempt was made to request life jacket support before the MA, MOA was created that was rebuffed. Will this change the outcome of requests like this in the future? I doubt it because uh, that's just a request for, if I understand correctly, a, a request for a donation. That's going to depend on funding that's really independent of any of this. If the, for that, then. The, the life jackets that the Coast Guard Auxiliary uses are specific models. They're uh, issued to um, coxswains and crew and uh, trainees for going out on auxiliary patrols and they're not allowed to use them for anything but auxiliary patrols. Um, if a, a life jacket gets to the point where it's no longer serviceable for its intended use, then it's turned back into the Coast Guard and it is disposed of according to US government procedures. You're not going to get donations of life jackets from the Coast Guard or the Coast Guard Auxiliary for general use outside of um, auxiliary situations. There was a clarification that came in that was for youth sizes they have for, for loaner programs. Uh, the, loaner then, progr right. the loaner programs are not a part of either the Coast Guard or the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Now there are loaner programs that are funded by the uh, Boating Safety Fund that indirectly comes from the Coast Guard, but that money is not coming directly from the Coast Guard. All right, and we have another um, question. Could you expand on the concept of an auxiliary chartered ship being organized as a flotilla? Sure. Um, just as uh, my Sea Scout ship is sponsored by a Presbyterian church in my community, what we would have in this instance is uh, the chartered organization being a flotilla. Uh, the flotilla will have to register at least one of their members with the ship, that being the chartered organization representative. All of the other leaders could conceivably be non-members of the flotilla, but uh, as is the case for all uh, chartered organizations with BSA, they're making a commitment to provide certain support to the ship. And you should not translate that as being funding. Um, that might be something that a flotilla could provide, but it would really be up to them to decide whether they feel that they have funds that ca they can devote for that. They're not going to be receiving any US government funding for uh, covering the cost of uh, ship operations. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether I, I, uh, I got to uh, the, uh, the gentleman's question whether I've answered it. Well, I think the, um, I think you did. I, I guess I'd want to comment that, that there are a lot of possibilities here. You could have something that is, is pretty loosely coupled, just like we are with most of our charter organizations. You could have something that's really tightly coupled, uh, that's not required, but you could have a situation where every adult in the flotilla is an adult leader uh, every youth in the in the ship is a auxiliary member, and where the the flotilla and the ship were one and the same. Uh, I was speaking with uh, auxiliary Commodore King a couple of weeks ago, and he had a really interesting thought that there's really no reason that a ship couldn't start a flotilla. It doesn't have to go uh, from the flotilla a flotilla starting a ship. So right. 
the the combinations there are a lot of combinations that are possible and it's really going to depend on what the needs of the youth are if you've got a bunch of youth that really are in this because they want to be auxiliarists then then maybe that really tight integration makes a lot of sense if you've got <clears throat> a flotilla that just wants to enable sea scouts and help them out now and then maybe it's going to be more loosely coupled so i think you've got a lot of flexibility in the way this is structured to do this and and it's that answer is going to really have to happen on a unit by unit basis. And I have another uh, model to uh, uh, talk about just because it happens to be local. Uh, we have a new ship in Annapolis, Maryland that is uh, sponsored, I think, by the Seafarers Union. Uh, so the chartered organization is the union, but uh, one of the local Coast Guard Auxiliary flotillas has uh, committed to be not a sponsor, but uh, not the chartered organization, but a sponsor. They're committing to providing training as needed and uh, providing adult leadership uh, as needed. So they've made a, a, a formal commitment to work with this ship to help it grow and provide the training that the Sea Scouts in the ship uh, need, but they're not the char chartered organization in that case. And it seems to be working for them. All right, Bruce, that's run off the end of the, of the list of questions, so I think it's probably time to wrap up. Did you have any closing remarks, or did uh, Charlie, would you like to make a comment? So there is a question that came in here that I'm says... i myself off of mute here. I apologize. Uh, Very good. Go I'd ahead. I'd just like to thank everybody uh, who listened in today, but especially our presenters for doing a such a good job of explaining this SOP and the pilot program that's going to be going on. And do take advantage of methods to contact uh, the people who are delivering this, uh, Bruce and Josh and TW, uh, separately offline if you have other questions. And thanks again for attending. I see that a couple more questions have come in. Uh, what we should do, I think, is uh, we'll, we'll gather any questions that uh, come in and uh, we'll uh, shoot out answers to everybody uh, after we close down. Uh, Josh, is that something that we can support? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I think that in some cases, some of the questions are the sort of things that we want to have on the uh, FAQ page anyway. So taking a few extra moments to uh, put it in writing would probably be helpful for people. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, TW and, and Josh for uh, hosting this. And uh, we look forward to working with you on this. This is a brave new world for us. And uh, I know that the Coast Guard Auxiliary is very committed to making this work, but please be patient. Um, not everybody in the Auxiliary is able to fully uh, do everything that we've talked about today, but it's coming and it's coming very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you all.